Hej och välkommen till det här mötet som vi har gett namnet Krigens tillstånd. Namnet mitt är er Astrid Sverresdotter Dypvik och jag sitter i Norsk Pen sitt utvalg för öst och centrala Europa. Vi är er ju en organisation för författare och vi är er upptatt av det fria ord. Og vi inviterar til det här møte for, for å snakke om en side av krigen som vi alle sammen vet om, men som ikke alltid når like högt upp i nyhetsbildet som kampen om bakmot eller den kommende ukrainske motoffensiven, eller spørsmålet om nye kampfly til den ukrainske herren. Men likväl så är er det som är er tema för mötet vår i kveld er jo noe som er virkelig er krigens hjerte, og som handler om den ukrainske kulturen. I den världen sån som Vladimir Putin vill ha det så finns det ingen ukrainsk stat och inte någon självständig ukrainsk språk och heller inte ett eget ukrainsk folk som snackar det här språket. Men i våres världen så gör det jo det. Och vi vill ge plats till til Ukraina och vi vill höra på dem. Och vi har med oss två författare som har kommit direkt fra Ukraina i dag. Og, men de ska bli grundare introducerat lite senare. Men alle først nå så skal vi starte med musik. Det er Nina Gromova som skal spille Bandura, og hun er utdannet musiker fra musikkonservatoriet i Kyiv, og hun blev født i Magdeburg i Tyskland, og upplevde krigen som barn i, I Armenia. Og hun flyktet fra, fra Ukraina i fjor med to barn og bosatt sig i Larvik. Og vær så god.
Øst som sagt fra Penn, og jeg, det er viktig at dere vet at vi har en medarrangør her, som er den ukrainske foreningen i Norge. Og så har dere kanskje også sett de her lappene som ligger her, som er veldig anonymt. Og der står det at vil du gi et bidrag til Penn Ukraina, så kan du vips til Julia. Julia er styrmedlem i den ukrainske foreningen i Norge, og har vært som primus motor for å få i stand det møtet her. Så det er, vi Penn har jo ikke noen tradisjon for å, altså vi kjører alltid gratis prinsipp, og har ikke noen tradisjon for å samle inn penger, så derfor så gjør vi det på en litt sånn uortodoks måte her via, via Julia. Men altså, pengene går da til vår søsterorganisasjon i Ukraina, og de trenger, trenger de pengene og trenger støtte nå. Som ordstyrer i dag så skjønte vi med en gang at vi kunne ikke ha hvem som helst, så derfor så spurte vi Bernhard Mår. Han er forfatter av sakprosabøkeren «Hva vil russerne med Norge?» og «Hvorfor stemmer russerne på Putin?» Og han er også forlagsredaktør i Kappendam, og heldigvis så sa han ja til å være ordstyrer, så han skal snart eh, ta over her. Eh, vi har med oss eh, i dag Julia Musakowska, som er poet fra Lviv. Hun har gitt ut fem diktsamlinger og er oversatt til 30 språk, også til norsk. Den amerikanske historikeren Timothy Snyder har oversatt en av diktene hennes til engelsk for å bruke dem i en av forelesningene sine ved Yale. Og Julia er selv også aktiv som oversetter. Hun har oversatt Thomas Transtømer og Karin Boye fra svensk til ukrainsk. Og hun var også på den Oslo internasjonale politikken på Sifestival i, i fjor. Og jeg skulle si også at hun er oversatt til norsk av Marina Hobbel, som sitter her i rommet. Så dere skal også snart få, få høre, få se hennes norske oversetter, oversettelse. Eh, og i år er jeg også gjest på Norsk litteraturfestival på, på Lillehammer. Og så er jeg i tillegg bidragssitter i denne helt ferske boka State of War, som en antologi med bidrag fra flere ukrainske forfattere, og den boka har vi også drivet, og kan dere også få kjøpt her i kveld. Og så har vi også med oss André Lupka, som er forfatter og essoist og oversetter fra Ursjoråd. Han er særlig interessert i kultur og litteratur fra Balkan, og han er oversatt fra polsk, kroatisk, serbisk, bosnisk og, og engelsk. Og har også gitt ut romanen Carbide, som finns på flere språk, også på, på engelsk, og vi selger også boka hans eh, her eh, nede. Og han jobber også for den internasjonale poesifestivalen Meridan Tjernovits. Og han har eh, også en veldig god pengeinsamler, altså gjennom privat pengeinsamling, så har han finansiert 142 kjøretøy til den ukrainske herren, og han har også besøkt fronten flere ganger. Og det er han som er redaktør for den boka her, State of War. Og så er jo selvsagt begge forfatterne som vi har invitert med oss i dag, de er medlem av Penn Ukraina. Men nå skal jeg gi ordet til dem og til vår flotte ordstyrer, så vær så god. Thank you for that nice introduction, Ostri, and for inviting me to take part in this highly interesting event. Um, in my job at Kaplendam as an editor there, I publish two of the most prominent prose writers in Ukraine, um, Andrei Kurkov and Yuri Andruhovich. Um, and I've been looking very much forward to this, uh, to talking to two of the most important representatives of Ukrainian literature in the generation after um, Kurkov and Andruhovich. Uh, Welcome to Norway and Oslo, both of you. Thank you. Um, when did you get up this morning, Julia? Oh, I'm not really sure where, <laughs> when the morning was. Uh, first of all, hello everyone. I'm happy to be in Oslo. It's for the second time. I was here last year, as mentioned, at Oslo Poetry Festival. And I really love the city. I'm glad to be here. And you know, not, not just be here uh, as a visitor, but to talk on, on a very important thing. I think the, mo the most important, um, Ukraine's fighting against Russia in, in their brutal war, uh, and to talk through literature. Mm. Uh, and as to the morning, I, I really didn't have any sleep this night. I took the morning flight at 3 a.m. 
from Krakow and then to Warsaw and then to Budapest and then I'm here. <laughs> glad you glad you made it. Um, good to have you here, both of you. So you're, you're coming more or less directly from Western Ukraine, from Uzhgorod and from uh, Lviv. And um, during these 30 minutes or so, we'll try to touch upon uh, several themes, but uh, I wanted to start with, with a quite general question. Um, how, how are things there? Can you describe to a Norwegian audience um, how life is in your town, uh, Andri, uh, 15 months after Russia started its full-scale attack on your country? Uh, hello, thank you very much for having me here. Um, Actually, I have to start with uh, the statement that it was my dream to visit Norway, and it is my first time here. I was dream because I have two major hobbies in my life. Uh, first one is listening to opera music, and the second one is fishing. And <laughs> I was dreaming for for years and years that I will come here uh, and take a boat, but uh, now it is not. At not a right time for, for it, and I'm happy to be here. And uh, I would like to express my gratitude to Norway Pen and all of you, because I think that the the very fact of organizing this event is uh, actually showing solidarity with Ukraine and with Ukrainian culture. And uh, as members of Ukrainian Pen, we are very grateful to um, International Pen for for support and. Uh, for Norway PAN and for Swedish PAN with which we established very good cooperation during last year. It is very important that in these difficult times we, we have these links between us and uh, what is even more important I think and what we discovered during this year is that actually culture matters and not only in terms of culture but uh, all of the connections we made years and years, decades before uh, now are working uh, and uh, creating some network, some system to help Ukraine. It is not only about words, books and so on, but we really receive a lot of humanitarian aid and organized a lot of residences, shelters for writers and their families and so on. So it is something real. Uh, it is not um, not only art. My, uh, my situation is... Uh, quite strange in, in Ukraine, in my hometown, because I live in Uzhgorod, and it is the most western part of Ukraine. It is located on the border with Slovakia uh, and Hungary. And from my hometown to Amsterdam is closer than to Donbass, for example, and to the front line. Uh, Ukraine is huge. And um, when you ask how, how, it, how life goes there, I think that the most horrifying thing about the war is that I have to say that life is normal. The most terrifying thing is that we got used to the war, to all of these circumstances and uh, to all of this endless danger at every step and uh, we consider it normal. I think that uh, here in Norway life is not normal, but in Ukraine, for me, it is okay, it is normal, and you know, I got used to it. And when I crossed the border to Hungary yesterday, uh, and I see people are laughing, enjoying life, and, and so on, and they are going to the uh, airports, all airports in Ukraine are closed, uh, because airspace is closed, and so on. For me, it is something very strange. It is like a lion life, a di different planet, yeah? And uh, um, it, it, it is really this... Um, difference between uh, between my hometown and the first uh, city located in the EU it is only 15 kilometers yeah so we have the same weather everything is the same actually but uh, this border and uh, border of NATO for example is really important now life is Normal in a way that uh, shops are full of products uh, on the streets you can find a lot of people but probably not so much men uh, at the streets. Uh, usually you see uh, much more women with children, for example. Uh, my hometown was quite was quite small. It was only 120,000 before the war, and now it is 200,000 uh, of, of inhabitants uh, because we receive a lot of um, refugees. 
I don't like this word for for these people, but we receive a lot of people who uh, came from the eastern Ukraine, and uh, cities overwhelmed with with this uh, number of people. Um, from time to time, not from time to time, every day when you crop, when you are in the city center, you can see people who are staying on their knees at the sidewalks. And it means that it is the funeral of the military man. And we have funerals of military men who, is, who are from our town or, or villages located around uh, of Urgorod every day. And it is not only one person, usually it is two, three or, or more per day. And uh, when this car with, uh, with a body of uh, a soldier killed at the east, uh, everyone who is at the street, they are staying at, at their knees. Um, when we, we hear air siren, we pay no attention for it because, you know, we are quite sure, for every everyone is quite sure that if, uh, you know, you will be, um, that if uh, there will be a rocket attack, it will be somewhere else, not not here. And uh, this is the biggest problem for us, we have a small daughter. It is, uh, she is only two years, two and a half years old. And she, she goes to this uh, children's garden. And when you have this air siren, you have to, even if they are uh, asleep, you have to wake them and go to the basement. And basement is cold and, you know, and not so comfortable. And usually uh, we are rushing to, to um, collect her from the, uh, from the garden. At, at that moment, uh, but the most horrifying thing is that we already got used to it and you know consider it as a new normality everyday life. Is this uh, description comparable to what you experienced in Lviv, uh, Julia? Well, actually, Lviv has been less lucky. I think the last time I was in Oslo, I was telling this story at the festival that Lviv was fortunate to only be bombed six times, I think, during the, the, the entire invasion. Uh, situation changes very quickly. I mean, we had a very hard winter, and we didn't know if we would have heating and electricity, uh, if we could supply ourselves with some alternative sources, because every household, every business was buying a generator because the Russia was aiming at power infrastructure, at the critical infrastructure of the country, in order to, I don't know, subdue the nation. But it means that they really don't understand Ukrainians, because as, uh, as much as Ukrainians are um, enduring hardships, they're getting even more determined to fight. This is really a, a very bad tactic. Um, and... Um, the new normality, well, I should probably um, quote a, a wartime essay by uh, a Lviv-based uh, intellectual and literature scholar and, po uh, and poet, Irina Starovoit. Uh, she uh, used this metaphor of a rusalka. Rusalka, uh, in Ukrainian, it's not really a mermaid, you know, a, mer a Disney, uh, this Disney image. In Ukrainian mythology, it's a creature which on the front looks like a beautiful young woman. And on the back, you see the body with the insides hanging, you know, the bowels and everything. And I think this is a perfect metaphor for Ukrainians right now. So on the front, it looks like everything is normal. And, you know, we're uh, dressed in normal clothes. We're looking nice. We're walking with our children in the streets. And the shops are open and people are sitting in the cafes. Businesses are, are working hard, yet they have to work harder in these circumstances. Um, but there are so many other things, um, like we're getting news of our friends or our friends' relatives that have died at, at the front. Or there are some other devastating things. Um, and, you know, everything is of course, influencing us. And, and we are getting used to this. And I think it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's tragic that this is our new normality that Andre has been describing. Um, of course, Lviv was seen as, as a safe harbor 
despite the six or now I don't know how many dozen bombings. Uh, and many people were coming to Lviv. Mm, and then sometimes it was a transit station to further to Europe or you know to US. Um, but then um, after the liberation of Kiev region, many people were coming back. If their houses were still intact and the cities were okay to live in, they really were willing to come back. Many people came back from abroad also because, you know, home is home. Uh, it, it feels like you're really safe even if it's just an illusion. And uh, the, this new normality, I would call this an illusion of normality. Um, I had um, an opportunity to write an essay about that for uh, a journal, Sun Ok Sang, is, sure. is that the right, right title? Yeah. And, and I was trying to describe uh, this, this illusion of normality that we are telling ourselves and first of all telling our children that everything is okay. We now have the process, even if it's an air raid alert, we have the process, we have the, uh, the things that you need to do. And of course, schools and kindergartens are exceptional about keeping children safe. Uh, as Andre said, we are ignoring the, the alerts, but of course children are taking very good care of. But still, you know, the, uh, of course the planes are not flying and that's the reason why I, uh, it took me almost three days to come here. Um, and also the cities have changed how even visually how they look. Uh, if anybody of you have been to Lviv, uh, it's a, a marvelous, beautiful city um, with Asian churches and buildings. Andri Urgrot is, of course, a fine city too, but I'm a, a Lviv fan. Um, you can see how the, the monuments and the older buildings uh, were protected with different nets and cardboard, and um, um, they're now covered. And there, I think the, the volunteers or the organization behind it were also putting uh, very nice signs over this covering saying, you will see this beautiful monument after our victory. And this is pretty symbolic. But it, it, it really is different when you um, walk along the, the streets of the city, of, of your familiar city. I was born in Lviv and I've lived there um, probably my entire life, except for traveling and studying abroad. Um, and I really feel that it, it has changed. It has suffered, of course. And it, we are trying not to compare sufferings. It, it, it's one of the trends in, in our communication in, uh, between Ukrainian uh, intellectuals, that of course there are cities that have been destroyed to the ground. But you can feel the sadness even uh, at the, in the cities that are far from the front line. They, they have changed their face and also the atmosphere has changed. But now when we, are, uh, we have gotten ourselves out of this energy crisis and it feels like the streets are not um, overwhelmed with, um, with displaced people that they're taken care of or they have moved back or they have moved farther, um, it looks pretty normal. So I urge all of you, if you, uh, when you have an opportunity and when it's um, safer, and even now there are a lot of tourists, of course, come and, and visit Lviv and, and Uzhgorod as well. There is a very nice castle in Mukachevo, but Andrei knows much more about that. But if we move, move to the field of, of culture then, um, also in quite general and open question how would you say that war has the war has changed the the cultural scene and, and literature in in ukraine um it changed it completely because i think that it is quite hard now uh, or even impossible to focus on your creative work and um, for example in the very first months of the invasion uh, everything was closed and all if we speak about the literature, all bookshops, for example, all um, publishing houses and so on, they were closed. And for uh, thousands and thousands of people who are working there, 
it was impossible to receive salaries, so it was impossible to receive income for their families. And in these difficult times, when you really need to 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 feel some, I don't know, uh, at least financial safety, it was uh, really hard. And uh, uh, I think since the beginning of the uh, last summer. When we realized that uh, Russia will not win, when we uh, discovered that our army uh, is fighting and you know uh, starting to liberate uh, first territories, um, cultural process, uh, cultural infrastructure returned uh, to the work, but um, it was you know only few percent of the pre-war uh, process. Mm. I think that a lot of writers, uh, a lot of uh, translators, editors, and people from uh, literary world, uh, they are focusing now not only on writing, um, maybe even more. They are focusing mostly on something else, on uh, at least cultural diplomacy, on writing some essays for uh, media abroad. And a lot of writers became volunteers and a lot of writers uh, became joint armed forces of Ukraine. Uh, that is why, you know, I will use this metaphor. It is impossible to write a novel about the fire of your house. When you are sitting in one room and your house is on a big fire and you are reflex, you, you try to write something that in another room we have this danger and so on. Uh, my own example, uh, you know, is that I just can't focus on writing, on thinking, even thinking, because um, I can write some post on Facebook, I can write very, very short text, uh, one page long, um, as a column of fillet on something like this, but that's all. It is impossible to create some bigger and deeper and longer structure, because um, you are so nervous, you are so uh, stressful, uh, at every moment, and um, that is why maybe what I discovered uh, during the last year, maybe war is time of poetry. Mm. And uh, I discovered it in March when uh, we had anniversary of our uh, national, uh, famous national poet Taras Shevchenko, and I was looking for a quote in his book uh, to post it on Facebook, something about, you know, uh, something uh, which can be inspiring. And when I started to uh, look for it, I just can't stop because it was so incredibly strong. And I felt, you know, on my skin that this poetry is energetically, it is very strong. And uh, from that time, uh, I returned to, to something I had in my student life when I read a lot of poetry and I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed it and I can... At the time, I, I you know, I uh, read the book for a few times, uh, trying to discover some new nuances of phrases and uh, and so on and so on. And uh, probably this time is very good because poetry is is some kind of self therapy. When you write something, it helps you, and when you read it, uh, you receive this immediate help. Do you share this perspective, Yulia, that uh, in times like these, uh, poetry prevails over prose? Well, yes, that's my observation, but I also have my own story, uh, because I, I found myself uh, at first probably numb and unable to, to put the, the, what was happening into words, but then I suddenly felt the, the, the urge to, to write, and it was such a strong emotion that I felt that I would just burst, you know, and I, I had to scream it out. So the, these new poems of the uh, the last year and, and the newer ones, they're very different. Um, I remember that the first one that I wrote after February 24th, it was a, a poem and a text in English, because um, even if we were talking so much about the possible attack, um, we didn't really believe it's go that it's going to happen because the things that we discovered were absolutely evil, like pure evil, and we discovered that it really exists and it's done by humans. 
Um, so I found this English language as as a, a tool to to express what I was feeling, and um, uh, English is my work language. Uh, as Andre said, poetry is prevailing. I feel that now uh, in my life and in uh, within my personality, my identity, poetry is now prevailing, even if I have a different day job. I work as a marketing executive for a, a software firm in Ukraine. And before the invasion, poetry was like a very, uh, a very calm background job or it's not a hobby of course because I've done it for many years but after the invasion it felt like we had this need to write and also the world the outside world and the, the Ukrainians had the need to hear and to read this poetry to somehow comprehend through through the, the emotion which poetry is of the, these horrible things that were happening, these uh, you know the shift. It's it's a it's a huge shift in what we thought that our world, our reality was. Uh, so it was not a wish to write. It was basically a need to write, and it, it is some kind of therapy, but also for the other people of of the readers that were. Uh, of course, commenting and reacting, and many, many um, translators picked up these fresh poems and immediately translated them into different languages, like the same day or the next day. Uh, I was really shocked uh, about this reaction, but then we realized that probably poetry is the language that can describe both beautiful, most beautiful things and the, the most horrible ones. So um, now, um, of course, poets are um, those that, that have found the strength to write. They're, they're really productive. But for, for prose writers, I, I also feel that they, they're unable to focus. And they, if they write, they, they already left fiction. They went into nonfiction. Uh, also to find the words to describe this war, to describe these, these crimes of, of Russia and Ukraine. So yes, the, uh, the poets, they don't really want to be productive, but they, they're kind of forced to. Yeah, by the situation. But um, we need to talk a bit about this, uh, this new book, uh, Andriy, State of War, um, that you have been one of the two um, curators behind um, and you also mentioned a bit um, the volunteer work that you write about in your your own text in this book uh, a text called Roasted Uganda uh, but could you please start by uh, saying a bit about the book and where the uh, idea for it mm -hmm. came from yeah uh, so we have this anthology a state of war Voyennistan in Ukrainian um, in this book, we have 35 texts uh, written by prominent writers, intellectuals, uh, culture activists, managers, and so on. And it is some kind, you know, uh, we try to, to, to gather, to collect some texts which create some panoramic view uh, on our everyday life on this first year of the war. And um, I have two different stories about this book. Uh, one I never told in Ukraine, but I can but I can tell it here because <laughs> there are no uh, no our partners from from the project here. Uh, official version is that you know we together with our, together with our uh, publishing house Meridian Chernovitz, we decided that we live uh, you know in times of this instant news. This uh, stream of information is so huge and dynamic that uh, actually everything is on air, yeah, and you can follow events second by second. You can even use some web cameras and you know uh, watch battlefield and so on. And that is why there is no time for deeper and um, better reflection about the events, about the life, about the tragical circumstances we live in, and. Um, we decided that uh, we will uh, invite writers uh, to 
share their views, their personal uh, experience of the year, without uh, asking them to write something specific. Yeah, so it is. It was open invitation, uh, and we uh, gathered a lot of texts. It is 100 texts in Ukrainian. Uh, we had writers, translators, cultural managers, writers who joined armed forces, refugees. Uh, we pay attention to have uh, 50 to 50 uh, men and women and so on and so on. So we try to, to make this panoramic view and uh, to share it, to publish it immediately also in English in order to share it with uh, the audience abroad who are interested uh, not only in news, uh, in this news coverage, but uh, in something deeper and not only black and white. And it is official version of the <laughs> of of this book. And the unofficial? <laughs> the unofficial is that um, uh, at the beginning of June, uh, I was approached by representatives of one big uh, quasi-government uh, charitable foundation uh, from the USA, and they told me I had some in previous ye years I had some. Uh, activist background, uh, involved in, in social uh, things and, and politics and so on. So we had some contacts uh, during uh, previous projects. And they approached me and told that, okay, we uh, support uh, Ukraine with weapons, ammunition, humanitarian aid, money and so on. But uh, we think that it is also very important to uh, support Ukrainian culture and uh, especially Ukrainian writers and intellectuals. And uh, could you please organize some platform uh, which which could be independent and you know we can create website with very easy with very simple uh, Google form in which you can register, uh, upload your CV and uh, your bank account and uh, receive humanitarian aid, some stipend, for example. And uh, it will be uh, very easy. You have this independent uh, committee which will decide and we will have uh, opportunity to pay a lot of stipends to all of the writers and so on. And I was thinking about this project. It, it, they proposed really a huge amount of money. And I decided that we cannot agree with this approach because, you know, if you have humanitarian aid and uh, all kind of this support are very important. But if you have the smallest opportunity not to give humanitarian aid, you have to use it. And when we are at the situation that we can, um, you know, order some job for these people and pay them salaries and honorars, it is much better than only transfer humanitarian aid for them as for, you know, uh, people who are not important and they are uh, actually useless at that times, yeah? because you are writer or editor or translator, you are useless because it is war time of uh, mil uh, military service and so on. And we created a very big project. Uh, it uh, lasted uh, almost for one year. And in frames of this project, we had, uh, we collected first of all this 100 texts of different writers, translators and so on, and historians and so on and so on. But we also organized 72 readings in 14 major Ukrainian cities. Uh, and uh, usually it was cities located very close to the front line. So Kharkiv, Odessa, uh, Kropivnitsky, Kyiv, and so on and so on. And for us it was important to, you know, to return with cultural agenda, with cultural life to these cities. and But also, which is probably not so, um, not so pathetic, but I think that it is important to pay people uh, for their work. Because I don't know how it, it looks in Norway, but usually in Ukraine, organizers of literary events uh, and cultural life festival and so on, usually it is very uh, young people. And uh, they are enthusiastic, but they have no savings. And when the war started, they have no official job, and they were really out of any possibilities to to earn some money. Uh, and that is why we um, we asked them to organize these events, and we paid for everything. So for uh, uh, SMM uh, PR in social medias, uh, for uh, taking photographs, for making these online streams, for uh, layout of posters, 
uh, for texts, for authors, for the readings, and so on and so on. With the text, we also uh, um, translated uh, all of the all 100 texts, and uh, we have three anthologies. One is online, and it is full anthology. It, it is both in Ukrainian and English. Second one is Ukrainian, Voyenny Stan, and we have uh, 50 texts in it. And the third one is English, and it is only 35 texts in it, but it is not a uh, translation of Ukrainian one. It is uh, anthology uh, collected especially for the foreign audience with, you know, uh, and um, that is why I think that the tone and the atmosphere in these two books uh, are different. I can only talk about the English edition that I read, and I can um, really recommend it warmly to, to everyone. It's for sale here, uh, be, especially because it, it provides a multitude of, of perspectives on uh, on the war, how people, what people have experienced, um, and and there, there, there are many interesting perspectives. One that I found particularly uh, interesting uh, that at least two other contributors discuss. Um, Serhiy Zadan, the author, and Volodymyr Sheiko, who's director of the Ukrainian Institute in, in uh, Ky uh, Kyiv, they discussed the challenge in making foreigners really understand what it is to be Ukrainian today, um, what it means to, to live under permanent shelling and, and bomb raids. And, and Sheiko writes, um, to quote him, we speak, inquire, and persuade, but our foreign interlocutors do not have the capacity to absorb this information, which is unprecedented for them. Even basic facts are met with amazement, like how there are currently no flights over the territory of Ukraine. Women give birth in bomb shelters, and people live and work in cities without electricity. I, I, I guess that must also have been part of the motivation to really try to you know, convey those perspectives um, to a foreign audience. Yes, of course, and you know, as a cultural, not only writers, but as a cultural managers, we, one of our goals was not only to collect texts which are important and uh, um, can be uh, read as a political text uh, or so on, but we paid a lot of attention for the literary quality of the text. So if you will read this book, you know, I think that it is, um, war is not an excuse for bad texts. Okay, we are we are bombed, and that is why this text is very bad. But please support us, and so on. No, we uh, really did our best to collect very good texts and to select them, to produce the book uh, which is ready for translation. So, for example, if you want to translate something from uh, Ukrainian, it it is ready, and it is about the war, it is about Ukrainian culture, everyday life, written by the best writers, and so on. So it is expert product ready you know like key project yeah? so uh, ready for for the launching uh, to the foreign audience and it is part of our job uh, of course the first duty of the writer if, uh, also in the times of the war is to write uh, good and uh, try to do um, everything better and better but uh, in this uh, during the last year we received one more duty one more public role as cultural diplomats uh, who who are traveling abroad with with texts or thoughts or personally and uh, trying to tell our story i think that ukrainian voice uh, has to be heard and this is the idea of the book Time is running, so I'm, I'm going to jump a bit. Um, Russia's war on Ukraine is, I mean, it's obviously a war for geopolitical influence, for um, for land. Russia wants to c control its borderlands. But it's also most definitely a war against Ukrainian culture. Um, the, in the view of the Russian leadership, there is, there is no genuine Ukrainian culture. It's all part of Russian culture. There is no real Ukrainian language. It's a mere dialect of or Russian. Um, when you hear things like this from the Russian leadership, how how do you react um, emotionally and intellectually? Is is it possible to convey that to a Norwegian audience? Mm. 
Well, it's of course we think it is madness, and it's we are also very tired of, of all of this because it has been lasting since I think uh, 17th century. You know this. Uh, uh, the, the attempts to uh, destroy the Ukrainian identity and, and language and culture. And then we have had this um, terrible time uh, of 1930s of the, the Stalin's, um, uh, they call it shot renaissance or, or red renaissance, where about 30,000 Ukrainian intellectuals were physically uh, exterminated. Uh, and um, yes, so it's not just destruction of the identity and of something virtual, of something spiritual, but also physical destruction. And uh, um, it, it, is, um, it, it is something that uh, we have accepted as the fact, this intent to, to uh, destroy us. And we have this saying in Ukraine, uh, which, is, which can be translated as um, yeah, freedom or death. Voila, uh, abo smart. It, it doesn't mean just that living without freedom is like death. It means that if we are going to be occupied, we are going to be exterminated. And it mostly concerns the people with the bright minds, the intellectuals, because that's the, the first target on the occupied territories. And not even poets and writers. Uh, teachers and kindergarten teachers in Kyiv region, Russians have shot kindergarten te teachers, just, just punished them by death, because they were the carriers of Ukrainian language and culture to children, and it's, it's a huge danger for, for the occupiers. And sent the children to, to educational camps in, in Russia. Yeah, and they basically kidnapped uh, thousands, uh, I think thousands of children, um, and and trying to now trying to raise them as Russians and to continue to um, you know convince them that there is no Ukrainian nation. And you know, hearing this makes us angry, but we are really tired of that. And of course, this is madness. And we know that whatever uh, this regime, the the this. Uh, this aggressor is saying we have to uh, defeat them on the military field. And that's the, the, the most important thing. And this, um, this will put this conversation aside. But I, I, I really want to, um, this is not within the, the frame of this question, but it's related to it. I really wanted to today to, um, to tell a few words about my essay in this anthology, because um, I don't usually write essays. I'm, I'm a, a poet and with a full-time job in different industry. And uh, when this request came to me, I was hesitant. But at that time, I thought about it, and, and there was only one thing I wanted to write about. I was ready to write about, because this was on my mind. Uh, and um, this happened last year. On, on my birthday, um, I heard the, the news from my, one of my closest friends and a godmother of my child that her husband has died uh, on the battlefield in Donetsk region. And of, co of course, it was a shock. And I, I think I, I'm still reliving this because these these are close friends, like a part of a of family to 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 us. And uh, um, I thought that maybe maybe I could put this story into into words. And I I remember I remember myself writing this in a sort of catatonic state. I was speaking with Andre uh, uh, after some time when when the book was published. I said, I really was in in some kind of um, um, you know a really strange state when you don't realize what you're doing. You just want to let it out. So um, and the why it's important. It's also that Sashko um, Osatko, who I'm speaking about, um, my friend's husband and my friend. He was a writer that never saw his book published. We, uh, together with his wife, Hannah, um, did our best for his stories to be given to the publisher after he died. 
he, and he published them online initially, didn't he? He did publish them online, but he never took them seriously. But when the publisher and one of the Ukrainian top publishers, Old Lion, when they saw these, these stories, they were mesmerized. They said, this is huge. This is so talented. Why didn't he uh, approach the publishers with these texts before? So basically, this book came uh, came out uh, early this year, and you know when we are using this uh, this this phrase, this quote, or this concept of the death of the author, we we, we hear it a lot a, a lot of times that uh, we should only. Uh, read the text and try to comprehend the text because the author is dead. But now, in, in our reality, it's really the author is dead. And, and the book is coming out. And I think it's, it's really heartbreaking and, and it's something that you would never imagine could happen in our modern times. And uh, also, um, th this story is very special to me and I'm, I was... Um, I was surprised to find it among the, these 50 texts and among these 35 texts in the English translation. And it's really special um, special to me and, and to, to Hanna Osadko, who is uh, Sashko's um, wife. And um, I really wanted to talk about this today because it's one of the reasons why I'm here um, and one of the reasons why I uh, didn't sleep and took this 3 a.m or I, I woke up at 3 a.m. to take the morning flight, because I thought I should be here in time to speak about Sashko's story. I should do it for Sashko, so that, that's, that's the main reason why I did it. People like this, that's the title of your story, right? It's a, it's a very touching text, um, without doubt. Um, Andriy, would you, would you like to add anything to the question I asked? Um, regarding I've already forgot Ru the question. <laughs> Rus Russia's attack on, on Ukraine as a notion, uh, Ukraine's right to self-determination, to being a nation, to being a, a cultural entity. Actually, it is not uh, a surprise for us. Uh, it really lasted for centuries and uh, this struggle is really old, deep and uh, each generation of our ancestors had something to do, do, to do with it. Um, but usually when, you know, I prefer uh, to speak about Ukraine and Ukrainian culture because when we start to speak about Russia or Russian imperialism or something like this, we once more speak about Russia and we focus on Russia. And I think it is maybe one uh, side effect of the war, which is quite positive, quite good, that uh, abroad in the EU and uh, all over the world, uh, people discovered that Ukraine exists, that uh, Ukrainian culture is quite interesting and it is modern and normal. And uh, it is opportunity for us to be heard, to be translated, uh, to be invited, for example, and present ourselves, uh, our point of view. And um, actually, why this, this book is uh, a bit strange, because the entry word to it was written by the General Valery Zaluzhny. He is uh, commander of armed forces of Ukraine. And it's quite strange when General writes entry word for the literary Almanach. He writes quite well, I think. Uh, but first of all, we have, we, we have to emphasize that he's quite a young guy. So he was uh, raised in uh, uh, independent Ukraine. So uh, he um, went to the Ukrainian not Soviet uh, military school and so on and so on. And a uh, few weeks ago, uh, we had a popular video on, on social medias uh, in which Zaluzhny uh, recall some uh, some poetry from Serhii Jadan. Yeah? So, and it was by heart. And he is, you know, quote his poetry. And it was really, really inspiring because, you know, he is normal guy. Uh, quite young, uh, he he was actually um, formed, shaped, raised on Ukrainian culture in this uh, in the Ukrainian independent state, and for him it is very normal to be part of uh, to be part of it, and it is he who actually uh, call 
what we are doing as a cultural front. I don't like this uh, uh, term, but um, we are here because armed forces of Ukraine are fighting now and uh, a lot of people are killed. Uh, and uh, when we speak about Sashko, uh, I, I'm thinking now about these words, yeah? so he died. He, he Actually, he, he was killed and it is very important uh, to understand that people uh, give their lives uh, in order for us to to be heard, uh, in order for us to to live, as I uh, as I told before, normal new normal life, and uh, that is why you know Russia is uh, a huge topic and endless topic. Uh, when I'm abroad, I I recall Norway example, and I say, look at Norway. Uh, they have gas, they have oil, and everything, but they don't uh, put every uh, all of the money for bombs, rockets, killings, uh, all of this political uh, corruption, and and so on and so on. So I think that. Once more, when we have opportunity to speak about Ukraine and focus on it, it is better and it is our uh, part of the work. I also wanted to add something uh, about, about this uh, this concept of um, Ukrainians um, as showing something extraordinary. Uh, because we hear it uh, a lot, oh, wow, Ukrainians are so extraordinary because they're resisting this huge empire. Uh, but basically, um, this is what happens when you are threatened, when your country is threatened, and when your close ones, your loved ones are, are, are threatened. Something uh, comes from within. And here I, I will go back to Sashko Sadko's uh, humorous stories. He wrote about common people, like villagers, uh, like, for example, one of them built a huge spaceship just in his shed. And the other uh, two guys, they stopped uh, some kind of high-profile um, state official from corruption. So he, he left his, his bad ways and, and become good again. So there's this, um, you know, he believed that in every, every person there is something uh, something superior, something that can come out and can can make you do great things. And uh, it's not just uh, about Ukrainians; it's about all of us. It's it's only you know to look inside, uh, and uh, it doesn't have to be a, a disaster that happens for us to find that and really use it. Thank you so much for sharing this and uh, talking to, to me and to us, um, answering to my questions. We're going to have uh, a reading. Uh, you'll both read uh, to the audience. Uh, well, we need to fix some technical issues before doing that, so I suggest that we take a couple of questions from the audience. In the meantime, while we prepare, prepare the screen, if anybody would like oh. to um, say something or ask a question, to our two guests, please raise your hand. Yeah, Mikhail Nidal. Okay, thank you uh, for your talks and, and thank you especially for describing the processes behind this anthology. It was, I was very, um, it was important to hear that it had this elaborated and big social aspect that is not seen in the anthology. Uh, but I wanted to ask, you say that the uh, Ukrainian edition and the English language edition, that they differ. In what way do they differ principally? What, what is kind of the main shift of focus or shift of, I don't know. Uh, I would like to, to, to add something about you. You told about this social uh, aspect of, of the work. You know, usually, for example, if you are an uh, established writer, uh, you receive a lot of um, support, invitations, translations, and so on and so on. But 
culture is made not only by this, um, not only by writers, and book is not only a product of of, of the writer or writers and so on. And um, for us, it was important to uh, also to support people who are invisible and uh, who editors, uh, people who make layouts. Designers, uh, people who are regular, normal workers at these printing factories, and so on, and um, because they are uh, at risk, at the same risk as as the writers, but um, of course, this international attention uh, create a lot of possibilities for for public personalities, for intellectuals, writers, and so on, and. Um, <clears throat> But not for all of the cultural, or literary, or publishing industry. So that was important. Uh, the difference is very simple. It, it is not political, for example, because uh, uh, there is no uh, political difference in, in in our main message: yeah? support Ukraine. It is two words that that we are uh, happy to share. A difference is uh, starts from the your first question, you know, what about every everyday life? If we will publish in Ukraine something about everyday life, uh, it will be not interesting for Ukrainians because we live in it and uh, for us some stories about um, uh, what you can see in the supermarkets are actually, uh, they are interesting and I think that in few generations, in even in 20 years, for um, uh, my children, it will it will be uh, really fruitful and productive to read something to in order to imagine uh, how it was. But um, uh, we uh, focused on uh, some um, everyday life and uh, describing of our. Um, historical arguments with Russia, cultural uh, background of the war, uh, experience of refugees in order to share it with foreign audience. And for example, uh, and of course we, we added these stories uh, which were written by uh, writers who joined armed for forces and became soldiers. Uh, and in Ukrainian version, uh, it is um, much more uh, about um, some personal stories, and it is uh, it shows also geographical diversity because part of them lives in Western Ukraine, and they are quite relatively safe. Part of them are refugees, and so on. So it is different di different focus, but both of of the books are good, uh, and. Uh, um, I think that you know it is when you have this huge, big anthology, you feel this danger that you will not end it, and that is why it is also it is also important to be uh, to be uh, quite um, uh, short, and uh, you know uh, when you see that it is possible to read it and you can uh, actually cover it. It's digestible. <laughs> And then there's one question on the first row here. Uh, hi, <laughs> my name is Lars Nigor. Um, I'm sorry, but I have a question about Russia. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, the, I mean, everybody's uh, debating uh, how we should approach Russian literature today. Um, because clearly, some Russian authors have some pretty horrible opinions, uh, like uh, Pushkin and Dostoevsky. Um, and some are more, ben more benign, like Tolstoy. And <coughs> with British authors, for example, Kipling, they, they also have imperialist um, opinions, but we sort of com com compartmentalize that. Can we do the same with the Russian authors? Did British, uh, or let's say, did Britain as a country uh, commit such atrocities as Russia? Can we really compare them? Yeah, probably at that time it was really 
uh, you know, time to, to view their literature through the imperial lens. But now we are in the midst of the, the conflict as is right now. So our opinion is that we, uh, it, Russian literature exists and of course it will exist, but perhaps the world needs to take a different look at it. Because now when we are, for example, rereading something uh, from Pushkin and like he's glorifying the extermination and the invasion of the smaller ethnic groups of Russia. And now we really understand what this is about. And we are looking at this literature uh, from a totally different perspective. And I think that academics now, those even those that are teaching Russian literature, they're starting to give this, um, how do you say, exp explanation or try to analyze it from that perspective because we can really go go on and on on, on things like um, you know this this taught helplessness or, or that Russian literature has taught through classics and many other syndromes that they're they're now showing uh, let's say in Russian society but of course we don't want to go on and on about Russia. I don't know if I if I'm I, I got close to to what you were asking. Um, last year in May uh, in my hometown, and uh, I would like to emphasize that it is the most western part of Ukraine, uh, which was never part of Russian Empire, never. Yeah, it was part of Austro-Hungarian Empire for centuries, and then in the interwar period, it was part of Czechoslovakia. Um, we started the process, uh, you know, uh, of changing uh, names of the streets in the city. And we discovered that in my small town, which is really small uh, in Ukraine, it is the smallest regional capital of, of the region, we found more than 70 streets named after Russian uh, writers, mostly scientists, uh, generals, some famous uh, persons, and so on. And even, I think that 25% of, of them uh, were not well known. So you know some, some, uh, some kind of, uh, you heard this surname, but you don't know who is it, actually. And in Ushgorod, which was never part of Russian Empire, we had a lot of these Russian street names. And I was, I'm a, I was a poet when I was young, and uh, I, was, um, I started the process of uh, replacing the monument of uh, Pushkin in my hometown. Because in the center, in, we have a beautiful river in the city, and uh, at the bank of the river, in the beautiful square, so it is really, really city, city center, we had the monument of Pushkin. And it is quite strange because, uh, that uh, in Ushgorod, which is on, on the border with uh, Slovakia and Hungary and was part of Czechoslovakia, it is not a monument dedicated to some uh, Jaroslav Hasek or I don't know, someone else from, from our uh, neighbors, uh, uh, but it was Pushkin. And when I was asked, why do you support this idea? Actually, I was uh, I was an engine of this idea to replace this monument and put uh, it to the local history, uh, historical museum. I answered that it is not about literature. We don't put in question quality uh, of uh, his poetry. Of course, he is a brilliant poet. Of course, we can discuss uh, some uh, imperialistic views of it, but it, he was a product of his times and so on and so on. But Pushkin in Ushgorod uh, have, has another role. He is, it is a monument of the strengths of Russian culture, that from Vladivostok to Ushgorod, to the Central Europe, you have the area dominated by Russian culture. It has nothing in common with Pushkin or his brilliant poems. And when we uh, are speaking about canceling Russian culture, it doesn't mean that we say that it is not good or something like this. No, we, are, uh, we don't want to use culture to, uh, to cover all these atrocities and uh, crimes which are made now. And when you see these Russian ballads uh, and so on and so on, Nowadays, uh, they are used by Russian state, by Russian propaganda, only to, to form this uh, image of the beautiful Russia. Uh, and Russia is not like uh, Russian ballet. 
We have time for one more question. Uh, the gentleman in the in the middle on the fourth row. Thank you. Um, my apologies for asking a very obvious question. Uh, your president, Mr. Zelensky, has uh, a background in the cultural sector, uh, being a stage performer and actor and running a production company. Um, and uh, seen from watching and listening from my safety here, um, it seems like he is almost, like you said, a cultural ambassador abroad as well. And he uses his understanding of, of the arts and culture in his rhetoric a lot. Uh, and I'm curious about your assessment, not of his politics necessarily, but uh, of having a president who comes from uh, the cultural sector. Who would like to answer? <laughs> Uh, to be sincere, I think that he's a rep uh, I put it like you know he's a representative of anti-cultural sector <laughs> in Ukraine because it is something very very far located from the what we call culture and uh, the probably arts. Probably mass culture. But yeah, mass culture, but low, low very very culture. very primitive. I think I don't like his jokes and his shows and his movies no. and so on. And I w even uh, didn't vote uh, for him. Mm, but. I think that it is. It was very important uh, at the very first hours uh, of the war that he had this uh, actor's background, because I think that first uh, uh, video statement that we we had uh, when the war started at the uh, early morning uh, of the 24th of February, actually it was a th uh, theater play, or you know, he he played the role that of self-confident man and the president, of course. Everyone uh, at that moment uh, was stressed and uh, scared and had a lot of fear and so on. But he's an actor, and probably it is his um, most important most important thing he did during these years that uh, he played this role. And uh, it was, you know, like you see that your president is okay, that he's not trembling. And uh, he's saying that I'm here, and uh, all the government is here, and we are ready to fight, and everything will be okay. And uh, you know, it was really important. And he played this role, I am sure. And uh, I'm uh, very uh, grateful uh, to him for for it. And I think that you know, it is like a school. Um, he, f uh, during these three years uh, when he uh, won the election and became the president, he did great job. And um, now he is much better than he was before, uh, also as a, as a public figure and um, state serviceman. Um, but I'm not sure he actually uh, is good in promoting of Ukrainian culture and so on. But his role now is different. But I, I, I should add that um, people say that he's a, a good manager on 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 the projects that he have done previously. So perhaps he will have some trust into a person that he can appoint and you know delegate the, the, this entire thing. And another thing is um, you know this confident man that he was playing I think he has, uh, from what, what we observe, he has grown into this role. If you compare the, the, his pictures from the, the beginning of the invasion and his pictures now, these are two different faces and two different people. And I would like to, to add, because it is important um, actually to, to, to say it uh, abroad, that um, he was a really Russian-speaking man for all of his life. And when, when he was elected, his Ukrainian was quite poor. And now he made a huge progress. And it means that, and uh, it is also important to add that he has some Jewish origin. And it is about Ukrainian state and Ukrainian democracy that uh, three years ago in Ukraine, uh, a man with Jewish origins, Russian speaker, was elected as a president yeah, and won the elections with uh, hilarious uh, result. It is important. But for us <laughs> Ukrainians, 
you know, I have a child. And uh, when you go uh, to your friends and all of them are uh, saying, what a wonderful child, what a beauty, what, wow. <laughs> and it is like with Zelensky, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is saying, wow, what a president. We would like to have the same one. And you know the truth. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> Andri Lubko and Julia Mosakowska, thank you very much. And uh, now you're going to read to us. So the floor is all yours, but let's give them a big hand for uh, the discussion. Thank you. So I will read in Ukrainian and you have um, the translation here at the screen. Roasted Uganda. З усіх речей, які я возив українським військовим на фронт, найважливішою була пачка кави. Кілограмовий пакунок свіжовсмаженої кави з однієї гіпстерської кав'ярні Ростерії в центрі Ужгорода. Прямокутний і блискучий зі стильною наліпкою Roasted Uganda. Річ радше для інстаграму, ніж для фронту. Втім, вона виконувала цілком оборонну функцію. Щоправда, допомагала захистити не тіло, а те, що важливіше за тіло. Людське в людині. Раніше, коли я писав вірші, я б назвав цю дивну субстанцію душею. А тепер хай буде психіка. Та кава допомагала захистити психіку, бо створювала відчуття, що ти не просто шматок м'яса, ціль для снайперів і бомб, а людина. Людина з її смаками, вподобаннями і звичками. Добре пригадую той ранок. Початок травня, як тепер, до речі, коли ночі ще холодні, але вранці повітря швидко набирає тепла і запахів. Селодець за Слов'янськом на Донбасі. Село, де військових тепер у рази більше за місцевих мешканців. Мешканці переважно виїхали, бо майже щодня околиці обстрілюють, і вночі неможливо заснути через звуки вибухів. Уночі, до речі, їх чути краще. Вони набувають об'ємності і лунають у темній тиші зловіще, як чуже серце биття. Того разу наша волонтерська команда приїхала в пункт дислокації військового підрозділу занадто пізно. Нас довго перевіряли на блокпостах, дорога була важкою, а через відсутність зв'язку ми трохи блудили незнайомими дорогами, тож прибули на місце в момент, коли ще не темно, але вже хочеться увімкнути світло. Це означало, що ми будемо змушені заночувати з військовими. Виїхати з цих місцин уночі неможливо через режим світломаскування. Онлайн-карти не працюють, місцевість нам незнайома, фари вмикати заборонено. У такій ситуації ми цілком могли ненароком виїхати на російські позиції. Тому залишилися ночувати. А коли після короткого і тривожного сну, що переривався звуками ближчих і дальших вибухів, прокинулися, треба було швидко виїжджати до наступного пункту. Проте мій друг, який після 24 лютого вдягнув військову форму і тепер служив у цьому підрозділі, зупинив нас. Заждіть, мовляв, зараз зварю кави. Електрики не було, тому він завів дизельний генератор, підключив до нього невеличку кавоварку, налив води, а тоді з коробки, яку я вчора йому привіз, дістав пачку кави. «Роустед Уганда» було написано на ній. Засипав у кавоварку, і вже за хвилину ранкове травневе повітря запахло елітною арабікою. Думаю, приблизно так писалася Біблія. Коли Ісус почав ділити рибу і хліб серед людей, вони мали здивуватися аж ніяк не менше. Бо це було якесь диво. У найгіршій на той момент точці світу, десь під Слов'янськом на Донбасі, у розпал війни отримати металеву кружку з ідеально приготованим еспресо. Мабуть, то була найсмачніша кава в моєму житті. Звучить банально, але що поробиш, якщо так і було? Вловивши моє здивування, друг витримав театральну паузу, а тоді відповів на питання, яке ніхто так і не наважився поставити в голос. Ну а що? 
Можливо, я сьогодні загину. То чому це має бути день, коли я не випив свою традиційну нормальну ранкову каву? Та пішли вони нахуй. Від кави я не збираюся відмовлятися. Ніякий Путін це не зламає. Я звик зранку пити добре еспресо. То бодай на це. Я маю право. Після того я їздив у різні військові підрозділи 21 раз. На північ, на південь і на схід. Під російський кордон на Харківщині. На деокуповані території українського Причорномор'я біля Херсона. І на Донбас, який взагалі тепер знаю, чи не краще за своє рідне Закарпаття. Словом, я багато за ці місяці бачив, чув і пережив, але та фраза врізалася мені в пам'ять. Бо в ній відлунює щось важливіше за геополітику, театри воєнних дій і новинні стрічки. Бо уявіть собі людину, яка до 24 лютого була абсолютно цивільною, можливо, навіть латентним пацифістом, а після початку повномасштабного вторгнення опинилася на фронті. В її житті змінилося все. Відірвана від родини і дому, від своєї роботи і кола спілкування, від укладу життя і планів на майбутнє, ще й одягнена в маскувальну уніформу, яка допомагає зливатися не тільки з мільйоном інших вояків, а навіть із навколишньою природою, така людина хоч би й закута в найтовщу броню, раптом опиняється голою до кісток. Бо в неї вже немає нічого, що творило б саме її, немає її м'яса і крові. Все стає на службу спільній, загальній меті. Тоді відкривається ще одна війна. За право бути собою. Мати свої смаки і неймовірною ціною утримувати свою рутинну звичку. Адже випити улюбленої кави зранку – це ніби потрапити додому, провести час зі своєю сім'єю, побути собою. Бодай три хвилини на день, які маєш не для глобальних цілей, не для держави, а лише для себе. Фраза мого друга про основоположне право людини зберегти свою індивідуальність, власне обличчя, про право бути не лише одним із мільйона українських військових, а й залишатися одним, єдиним таким. Так, це ще одна війна. Невидима війна за свій особистий час. Від десятків вояків я чув, що під час бойових чергувань в окопах і бліндажах вони активно читають. Зокрема, й ті книжки, повз які пройшли в університеті, а також сучасні бестселери з маркетингу і історії бізнесових імперій. Читають, бо у такий спосіб створюють собі відчуття, що не марнують ці дні, а використовують їх для власного розвитку. Бо війна краде в нас усе. Але, може, найперше, краде наш час, наші продуктивні роки, період, який означують фразою «у розквіті сил». Краде безповоротно. То що робити, опинившись в окопах цивільним, як не намагатися вхопити цей час за хвіст, відірвати шматочок і для свого цивільного життя? Тому і вчать на фронті німецьку мову через Duolingo на смартфоні, читають історію створення корпорації Ікея, чи беруть просто поруч із полем бою уроки з водіння автомобіля. Читають і вчаться, щоб час не видавався змарнованим. Так, я знаю, що це самообман але він допомагає людині триматися. Мабуть, саме заради цього знання я і їжджу до наших військових на фронт. Усе почалося минулого квітня, коли мій друг, учора цивільний, а тепер військовий, подзвонив і під час бесіди обмовився, що їхньому підрозділу зараз найбільше потрібне авто на повному приводі. Річ у тому, що після початку війни українська армія збільшилася в сім разів. Вояків набрали, видали їм форму і автомати – але з техніки – хіба якісь велетенські вантажівки чи старі автобуси, натомість мобільного і прохідного транспорту – катма. Наведу такий приклад. Новостворений підрозділ з мого рідного міста Ужгорода на початку березня відправили на Донбас. Оскільки підрозділ цей, як сказано, був новостворений, то транспорту не мав зовсім. Для перевезення військовим надали старенький шкільний автобус. До Донбасу з Ужгорода далі, ніж до Венеції – тому не дивно, що той жовтий автобус дорогою зламався. Військові майже добу прочекали на морозі, але в перші березневі дні країна все ще перебувала в хаосі. Відповідно, на допомогу їм нічого не вислали. У підсумку військові, які, нагадую, ще за якихось два тижні до тих подій були цивільними, самі скинулися і за власні гроші проїхали останні 200 кілометрів на таксі. Український вояк, який вирушає на фронт на таксі, це також один із символів цієї війни. Тож, коли на весні 22-го року я почув від свого друга, що їхньому підрозділу дуже потрібен джип, у мене виникло природне бажання 
допомогти. Я почав міркувати про знайомих чи благодійні фонди, які б могли швидко вирішити це питання, але невдовзі усвідомив, що так терміново ніхто нічого не зробить. Тобто треба не доброчинні організації шукати, а дивитися в дзеркало і братися самому. Того ж вечора я написав у Фейсбук оголошення про те, що збираю гроші на джип для військового підрозділу на Донбасі і дав номер своєї банківської картки. А коли прокинувся, на моєму рахунку були гроші на два джипи. Таким чином, мов би, сама собою, і визначилася моя теперішня зона відповідальності. З квітня 22-го року я вже не письменник, бо майже нічого не пишу. Зате збираю гроші і купую автомобілі для української армії. Ми з командою однодумців їх ремонтуємо, фарбуємо в камуфляжні кольори і відвозимо на фронт. Станом на сьогодні я купив 151 автомобіль для, збро... для Збройних сил України і здійснив 21 поїздку до військових підрозділів. Усе це стало можливим завдяки моїм читачам, які раніше читали мої тексти і приходили на презентації книжок, а сьогодні підтримують мою волонтерську діяльність своїми грішми. Це особливе задоволення і визнання для письменника. Бачити, як твої читачі довіряють тобі у реальному житті. Розуміти, що написані раніше книжки створили невидиму, але надійну спільноту. Письменник, який нічого не пише, це теж Лебонь, один із символів війни. Часом я жартую, що читачі так активно перераховують мені свої донейти, щоб я займався саме автомобілями і більше нічого не писав. Хоча писати мені є про що. Коли ми з колоною джипів їдемо на схід, а така подорож займає півтори доби в один бік, я маю багато часу на роздуми і мрії. У такі години я уявляю свою першу повоєнну книжку. Вона буде про все на світі, тільки не про автомобілі. Після війни я взагалі куплю собі велосипед і більше навіть не дивитимусь на автівки. Настільки мені вони вже в печінках сидять. І багато писатиму, надолужуючи вимушену війною паузу. Писатиму про людей, про людське, про ситуації голоси. Про війну як приватний досвід, а не як про геополітичну катавасію. Напишу про те, як страшно було вперше їхати з мирного Ужгорода на фронтовий Донбас. Але коли я туди доїхав, виявилося, що там, біля війни, страху немає. Бо страх – це поняття внутрішнє, а не географічне. Напишу про одного з водіїв у нашій команді, який під час зупинки в Слов'янську готував для нас бутерброди і порізав руку, відкриваючи бляшанку з консервами. Через 50 років, коли внуки спитають його «Дідусю, а що ти робив під час війни?», він зможе відповісти їм правду. «Багато розказати не можу, скажу лише, що пролив свою кров у Слов'янську». Не писатиму лише про розмову з одним солдатом, який приїхав додому в коротку відпустку, перебрав вина і звірявся мені. «Знаєш, я хочу тільки одного. Це артилерійська війна». Більшість часу ми сидимо в окопах і молимося, щоб нас не накрило бомбами. Я вже 9 місяців на війні, а досі не бачив у прицілі жодного росіянина. Так ось, я боюся, що на мене впаде бомба, і я помру. Я готовий померти, я боюся не смерті. Я боюся смерті від бомби, у вісні, під час обіду, за столом або страх уявити, в туалеті. Бомба ж не вибирає місця. Я пішов на війну і прийняв можливість смерті. Але прошу тільки одного. Хай мене об'є людина, а не бомба. Хай я побачу ворога на власні очі. Хай Бог дарує мені цю останню людську ласку – загинути від рук людини. Хіба ж я так багато прошу? And I would like to add uh, one, one, one short remark that uh, I returned from the last trip to, to Donbass on Saturday, so only three, three days ago. And uh, what is really uh, important is that uh, a few months ago I received a donation made by Yulia uh, Musakowska and she told me that she wants to transfer money because she received some honorar for the publication in, in uh, Norway literary magazine. And she want to support uh, our armed forces. So, yeah, you have this example. Who who is donating? <laughs> you were not supposed to tell that story here, but okay. <laughs> yes, it was um, 
the um, what I got for publicating the the essay and uh, of course for the the honorarium for participation in the Oslo festival. So I'm glad this uh, th these money do do the important work. So thank you really for what you're doing. This is really grand and, and really important. It's an honor to be here together with you. <laughs> We cannot keep with the numbers. I was just telling Astrid that when she was introducing it, it's already eight cars more than <laughs> she had in her paper. So I, I also advise that you follow Andrei Lupka and you can follow his uh, PayPal and uh, and his work. He's very good in describing what they eat and how they go and how is the whole trip and how important it is. Okay, ready. My turn. Mm -hmm. So these are uh, the poems translated into Norwegian by Marina Hobel. Thank you. And um, these are not only the poems from last year and f uh, starting from the beginning of the full-scale invasion. Uh, some of these are from uh, earlier years, but I just want to remind you that Russia's war is lasting uh, for already eight years, so it's, it's just the scale of the invasion that has changed. Жорстока гра із літніх таборів. Поволі накривати простирадлом лице того, хто прокидається. Немов випадає стіна. І хтось кричав від страху, наче вперше. Ти пам'ятаєш? Вони прокинулись найпершими. Я знаю кожного в обличчя. Всі вони мої. Зі зброєю дитинства у руках. Пригадуєш, ми грали в Робін Гуда. Вже час дорослішати. Все тепер по-справжньому. Яскрава пластикова каска, дерев'яний меч і лучник схожий на архангела, що на твоєму боці. Птахи з підпаленими крилами, знаряддя помсти. Люди – це знаряддя? Чоловіки і жінки, а часом зовсім діти, вихаркують криваву пісню єдності. Цей запах гару в'ївся в шкіру, солодкий дім вітчизни. Моя дитина спить, долоньку примустивши під щоку. У мене ж очі печуть і досі. Лютневе сонце тече бруківкою, Хтось плавить серп і молот. Відбиток тіла на прапорі проступить, Як плащаниця. Благаю, не накривайте їм обличчя. Їм нічим дихати. Війна, що її носиш у нагрудній кишені, Мов лисеня прогризла в тобі дірку, З якої раз по раз вивалюється серце. Зашиваю мовчки, міцно стуливши краї, Затерплими негнучкими пальцями. Сподіваюся, що вистачить надовше. Місто засинає, прокидаються шрами, чорна гусінь. З неї, якщо метелики, то лише мертва голова. Місто пускає пару з ніздрів, наставляє гори, як роги. На дні озера Вижаються обличчя товаришів. Похмура казка дитинства, що справдилася. Хоч і був чемним, поважав старших, задовольнявся малим. 
немає насправді ніякої справедливості. Подряпана металева кружка, з якою не розлучаєшся. Поверхневий сон і люта ненависть до фейерверків. Міг втратити значно більше щасливчик, майже цілий. Ти обрав мене, бо маю в мілі чутливі пальці. В них зручно тримати дрібні предмети, наприклад, голку. Руда мордочка визирає з твоєї кишені, облизується, згадуючи на смак птаха мого спокою. And these are from last year. Дивилися на голе розтерзане тіло моєї вітчизни. Знімали і публікували фото і відео високої роздільної здатності. Жахалися, засуджували, непокоїлися, прицмокували. Гучно вболівали і підбадьорювали. Дивувалися, що ще жива, захоплювалися стійкістю і хоробрістю. Пропонували їжу і питво, вологі серветки, ліжко місце, дозвіл на працю і все задармо. Поки скажений пес виривав з її тіла криваві шматки м'яса за мізинець до сонної артерії. Зібрався цілий натовп людей при повному озброєнні. Але ніхто не натиснув на спусковий гачок, аби його раптом не струснуло віддачею. And I'm going to end with the, the poem that was translated by Timothy Snyder and read in his Yale course on Ukraine's history. I'm really grateful for this translation. Такі незручні, такі страшні вірші, повні, люті, такі неполіткоректні, жодної в цих віршах краси, жодної естетики. Метафори сохли і розсипались, не забуявши. Метафори закопані на дитячих майданчиках під на швидкоруч збитими хрестами. Завмерлі у неприродних позах біля під'їздів будинків, присипані пилом. Готували їжу на відкритому вогні, намагались вижити. Загинули від зневоднення під завалами. Розстріляні в авто під білим прапором із простирадла. З яскравими наплічниками за спиною лежать. На асфальті до лілиць, поруч із котами і псами. Даруйте, але такі вірші – це все, що маємо для вас на сьогодні. Шановні пані та панове, глядачі театру війни. Thank you. I want to thank you, everybody, on the behalf uh, of the Ukrainian community in Norway, on behalf of Ashara Astrid, and Taksami for inspiration of all. Um, I want to thank you, everybody. That says uh, everybody we asked today, everybody said yes. So we were so uh, happy that everybody could make it today, despite the um, cancel flight, despite the bombs, the, despite the uh, everything that's happening right now. That we are all here, we gathered, and um, the more I'm studying and reading about Ukrainian literature, 
I think the more it's a bit of a miracle that Ukrainian language survived, that we have still this history of Ukrainian writers, the generations of Ukrainian writers. And I think this is so important that we are here now, uh, that we are talking about the generation of the 60s, 60s that was just destroyed, that was just uh, killed, manually wiped out. I'm so happy that yesterday International Publisher Association awarded a special award, Lottery uh, Laureate uh, 2023, Prix, uh, Prix Voltaire to Volodymyr Vakulenko. I think this is so important that we remember these names. We heard another name today, Alexander Sadko. I think uh, as long as we talk about these names, as long as we read this literature, as long as we challenge ourselves to learn more about Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian literature and books, I think the more we have chances to win all together in this. Thank you so much again for coming. I inspire you to buy the book to read the books, to donate uh, to Pen Nor Ukraine. You can also go to their webpage online. You can donate directly. Uh, you can also donate directly to Andri. I'm thankful for their... Uh, we are combining many roles during the war. I mean, the, we are all uh, parents. We are all... Uh, we have professional life, but we still have time today to get together and to talk. I think this is very important that we are here today and... Uh, Yes, and there is um, a new book published uh, right now, uh, just fresh from print from printing. I understand um, that it's a Swedish translation of. Um, I think we have a couple of them here, uh, just directly from uh, print. It's uh, Darina Hladun. It's Ukrainian, uh, also poet and writer. That is possible. Oh yeah, okay. It's I haven't seen it. It's a really interesting book. You can have it both ways. So it's uh, Julia Mosakowska, uh, Stener Och Speak uh, in Swedish. And it's Darina Hladun, Kriget Burer Inte Morgen. And I think uh, both writers are also be available in Lillehammer. So I invite you all, if you have a chance, to visit tomorrow at Lillehammer. I know also Oksana Zabushko and Alexandra Matvichuk are special uh, guests of honors there. Uh, I know there is a big book coming, Oksana Zabushko. I don't know, is it in autumn or winter next year? Yeah. Yeah, but just get ready. It's a it's a huge book. I, I read it in one week, so <laughs> I, I'm sure you can manage it. But uh, there is a yeah, Alexander Zabushko available. Andri uh, Yuri Androkhovich was on the stage with Erlen Lou. It's also available by Kapel and Dom, as uh, Bernard mentioned. Serhii Jadan is translated by Pax uh, into to Mesopotamia and um, Anarchy. Um, yeah, a lot of. Okay, that's it. That's it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it's a lot about these people in this room that works for Ukrainian literature to be presented on the region scene. Thank you so much. Thank you. And there is, there is friends.